Well, good morning and welcome to our service this morning. And it's just wonderful that um, you could all join us on this beautiful morning. And it is lovely to be enjoying the spring weather. And so, yes, just a very warm welcome to everybody here. And we look forward to today's service and especially what Matt uh, will be bringing us uh, in his message today. So we look forward to that. We'll talk a, a little more in a moment just about the passage he'll be, he'll be speaking from. Uh, also, just a side note, we'll be celebrating uh, communion together today. So if you're able to be prepared for that um, with uh, some, some grape juice and bread, that would be uh, fantastic. And so let's just start with a word of prayer. Pray with me. Father God, we just praise you. You are our King. We just want to celebrate together today and worship your name above high. For you are Lord of all, and in the midst of the chaos of our world, you are in control, and we thank you for that. And today, as we reflect upon the mysteries of what the scriptures teach us, we just pray, Lord God, that you would grant us your wisdom, that we would just understand and know the, the beauty of everything that you have put in place. And Lord God, we just praise you for the hope that we all share together. So we just come together now. And uh, we just want to sing your praises on high. Amen. Well, I want to just um, extend a, a special welcome to all of our dads out there. So it's Father's Day today. And I hope that you got spoilt just a little bit. And hopefully you got breakfast in bed. So fantastic. So breakfast in bed. And, um, and I hope your kids were able to spoil you with a few gifts and, and you know, things like that. And, and uh, I, I guess you're, you're never too old to enjoy all of the fun things. And uh, it's just a wonderful thing that our families are able to celebrate Father's Day. And so hopefully um, you rightly so have been spoiled today and, and you're able to really enjoy everything with your family. So huge welcome to our dads out there. Okay, today Matt's going to be talking on a really interesting topic and it's along the lines of the mystery of um, the gospel. And the, there's a verse that comes from 1 Timothy 3.16, which Matt will be basing his talk on today, and this is what it says. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. And so we really look forward, Matt, to the message that you're going to bring uh, us today. And, and I guess in just reading that, uh, I always remember growing up, you know, following my father around and... Um, you know, we'd, we'd be out in the paddock or we'd be out in the shed or we'd be somewhere. And I was always in awe of his ability to be able to uh, achieve all these amazing and wonderful things. And so, you know, I, I guess, you know, as we grow and we, we continue to walk alongside our dads, we, uh, we learn what a lot of those mysteries are. And so, you know, one of the things my dad taught me, he always um, would be along the lines of, you know what? If we've got to fix this thing, he said, um, don't use force. Don't use force. Just uh, get a bigger hammer. And so, you know, you learn little tricks and tips along the way and, and, um, and you know, Dad's wisdom would, would rub off and, and over time we would fix things together and, uh, you know, we would soon learn that uh, we'd be able to go off and fix things with, with the, the knowledge that we would pick up. Well, understand that uh, the Gospels, and uh, the, the writings of Paul and uh, the other writers of the Bible all have uh, granted us some form of wisdom about this incredible man named Jesus. And, um, and it's the faith that um, we have in Jesus coupled with our spiritual walk that start to unlock the mysteries of uh, all that, that God wants for each and every one of us. So let's be challenged by that. And Matt, we look forward to the message you bring us shortly. Okay.
Hi, I'm Dave Richards. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. I love the way Jason tells stories and uses them to illustrate a, a spiritual point. And uh, I, of course Jesus was the master of using everyday situations and items to uh, bring a spiritual lesson to us. The one that we're going to celebrate now is um, where he, in that last meal that he shared, the, the special Passover meal that he shared with his disciples, he repurposed parts of it to help us to remember what he's done for us and also what our response should be. Our brother Kai loves to make bread and unlike the unleavened bread, which we read about in the Bible a lot and probably Jesus used, the bread we tend to use has a yeast culture in it which is kept alive and it's the essence of the bread which is transferred from one batch of dough to the next. So too, with this simple symbolic act of remembering the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, what started with 12 people celebrating the Passover meal has been passed on over 2,000 years to us in this generation and in this place on the other side of the world. And although there's rich meaning in the symbols that are used, the most important thing is not what kind of bread or whether it's rice, uh, rice, rice cakes where you can't get wheat flour. 
the important thing is, is remembering what Christ has done for us and our, our humble thanks for that. And likewise, it doesn't matter if you're sharing this uh, celebration today with us in a huge stadium full of believers, a church building, a small family group, or whether you're just on your own with God in your room. You are still in communion with all the believers through the ages, through His Spirit, and those who are celebrating this today throughout the world. In Luke 22, we read that during the meal, Jesus took some bread, gave thanks for it, handed it to His disciples, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Eat it as a way of remembering me. So let's do that. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the bread that you give us to sustain and strengthen our bodies and satisfy our hunger. Thank you so much more for the spiritual bread of life, our sinless Lord Jesus, who you gave for us to save us. In Isaiah 53 it says, He was wounded and crushed for our sins. By taking our punishment, he made us completely well. Amen. Let's eat bread to share with him in his death and life until we eat it with him in his coming kingdom. After the meal, he took a cup of wine and said, This is my blood, poured out for you, and with it God makes his new agreement. Thank you, Jesus, for pouring out your life on the cross for our forgiveness. To pay the price for our freedom, back into right standing with a holy God. Amen. Let's drink to proclaim his sacrifice until he comes.
Hi everybody, hope you're enjoying your time in your homes. It's nice to get out though, isn't it? Today's readings from 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Beyond all question, the mysteries of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached, was preached amongst the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up to glory. Amen. Hi all, it's Pastor Matt Kennedy here, really looking forward to getting into the uh, Word of God with you guys today. Last week on the 22nd of August, it was my son Harry's birthday and he scored a couple of awesome gifts and it got me thinking about what the greatest gift that we could receive might be. Then I read a story about a conversation that was had between a father and his son uh, where the father asked the young man about what he thought might be the greatest gift that you could receive. The young fella thought of a few different things such as maybe health and strength and possessions like cars and houses and plenty of money. And how with each answer that he got when he gave them, the dad would say to him, no. He said, if only I had plenty of money, everything else would be okay. And the father empathetically replied, son, money is not your answer. Money cannot buy you health and strength. It can't buy you peace of mind. It can't buy you salvation. There is a mystery a treasure that God himself wants to give you, but you must want it and be willing to work and dig for it. This treasure, this mystery is the greatest gift that you will ever receive. Okay, if none of these things are our greatest gift, then what is it? Asked the son. To which the dad responded uh, definitively by telling him, none of those things really matter if you have never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. He went on to say, the book, being the Bible that you hold in your right hand now is your way to finding the greatest treasure that man has ever known. If you will read it with a prayerful heart and a mind that is ready to receive this gift from God, then he will unwrap its mysteries for you to see what is truly God's greatest gift to man. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that uh, you would give me the words to speak and each of us, Lord, myself included, the ears to hear. Lord, I just ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. So I'm wanting to welcome everybody to the next part of our series in 1 Timothy. So over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at 1 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul's been speaking on the requirements for those who take up leadership roles within the church. Uh, we first looked at the, uh, the role of overseer, which we call the pastor or elder. And then last week, we checked out the requirements of those who would serve in the role of deacons. Um, as Paul spoke on these two roles, he, he spoke also in amongst there in 1 Timothy 3, 3, 9 of a certain mystery of the faith. Uh, let me read that to you. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Now this mystery of, of the faith uh, that he talks about here is referenced further, on, uh, further along. So the verse 16, uh, which has been organized, um, which it seems like what we call into a doxology, which for those of you who are not sure what that means, it's kind of like a short hymn or song, which brings praises to God. Uh, this would often be added to the end of a psalm, but could also be found in other biblical texts, such as the things that we find Paul saying here, uh, where he's added it to the end of this chapter. Possibly in line with a similar practice at the time that could be found in the Jewish synagogues, um, where it was kind of like a, for want of a better word, bookend, uh, where it finishes that particular line of thought. While at the same time, it brings praises and worship and, and truths about God to God. And this this mystery of the faith, as mentioned in verse 9, it's that that we're going to be looking at very closely today. As Paul expanded on this particular verse um, in the passage that we're looking at, verse 16. This, I believe, is the central theme or the central focus, really, of the entire Bible. Uh, you might say it's the reason for the season. Let's check it out, um, starting at 1 Timothy 3, the very start of verse 16. Uh, if you've got your Bibles there, have them open and follow along. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. 
The godliness in this reference is a word or a concept that is and of itself, pointing in two directions at once, you might say. Firstly, it's pointing back over the passage that we've been looking at over the past couple of weeks, where Paul has described the requirements of those who wish to pursue the noble task of overseer, being a pastor or an elder, as well as the important role of deacon within the church. The, the root of this requirements that Paul has dealt with in this passage, it works its way back to one word, godliness. All people in positions of authority, in fact all of us, must act and pursue godliness in their lives and in their role. And Paul could not kind of like just say that. He understood that he needed to spell out what godliness looked like, especially in leadership, um, in the leadership role, um, in a practical sense. But then we come to the rest of 1 Timothy 16, where we see the one through whom all people who expire to be godly should look at as the perfect example. As we see in 1 John 2, 6, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. You see, Jesus was perfect in all of his ways. He never sinned and he always did what his Father in heaven asked of him. When we truly focus on Jesus, he will change the way that we view the world. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of a story about a mother who visited her boy at college. Upon entering his room, her eyes swept across the wall in which was covered with more than a dozen suggestive pictures. Her heart was grieved, but she said nothing. Several days later, the mailman delivered a package to the young man. It was a gift from his mother, a beautifully framed picture of the head of Christ. Proudly, the boy hung the picture up on the wall above his desk. That night before he went to bed, he removed the pin-up picture which hung closest to the face of Christ. The next day, another picture was uh, thrown into the waste bucket. Day after day, the pictures began to disappear from the walls until only one remained, the picture of the Saviour. When we bring Jesus into the picture, when we focus on him, then all other things will begin to be stripped away. Our sin will bear the brunt of our journey to Christ-likeness as we become more like Jesus and let go of our old nature and our accompanying sins. This verse that starts to speak about the mystery of the faith uh, that we believe or that we as believers hold on to, it is so important. And it moves on into the next part, which says, He was manifested in the flesh. This is a clear reference to the incarnation of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. This word incarnation comes from the Latin meaning in flesh. This in and of itself is not an actual biblical word, but it does present a biblical truth that we find in Scripture. You see, God had a plan, and we see that plan way back at the start of the Bible in Genesis 3, when God speaks of Jesus' coming, when he states at the end of Genesis 3.15, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The Messiah who was to be the promised deliverer of the Jewish nation ended up being so much more than what was expected. John 1.14 tells us, And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the one, only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God had sent his only begotten son to earth to be born of the Virgin Mary, as I had prophesied in Isaiah 7:14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is God, who became flesh and blood. God, knowing humanity, could not reach him because of their sin, himself reached down by entering the world by becoming man. And Jesus was able to do this while he still holding on to himself, you might say, both being fully God and yet fully man. He became a human being without the nature of sin. Um, this moves on to the next part of this passage, which is vindicated by the Spirit. Here we see that the claims of Godhead that Jesus made were vindicated or proven when by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus rose again on that third day from death to life. When he, he removed or, or left the grave to become alive again. If Jesus had come to earth and made claims that he had made and then just died 
then the best you might be able to attribute to Jesus was that he was an advocate for change uh, and really nothing more than that. In fact, C.S. Lewis makes what is a fairly famous statement about Jesus when he says, I'm try trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing, C.S. Lewis says, that we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus would, would, would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says that he's a poached egg or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool or you can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being just a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us and he did not intend to. With the resurrection of Jesus... We have some of our core beliefs about Jesus confirmed. Let me just go through some with you. Number one, with the resurrection, Jesus' claim to be the Son of God is vindicated. Without the resurrection, Jesus' claim is unfounded and Christianity has, is nothing more than a false religion. Number two, with the resurrection of Jesus, we know that his death on the cross was sufficient for our sins to be forgiven and our salvation is secure. Without the resurrection, we're still in our sin and we're still subject to the wrath of, of God. Number three, with the resurrection of Jesus, we know that we can trust both the apostles who testify to the risen uh, Jesus and we can also trust the Bible as the true and reliable word of God. Without the resurrection, we cannot believe the testimony of the disciples, which also cast doubt on the scriptures, um, which means that our own testimony and preaching of the word is false also. Number four. With the resurrection of Jesus, we know that those followers of Jesus who have died will rise up to be with the Lord for eternity. And when we die in Christ, we will rise up to be with the Lord for eternity. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there is no hope for Christians to be raised again out either if this was the case. Um, Paul's words in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 19 would ring true. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But we know that this is not the case because Paul goes on to say in the next couple of verses of that chapter that Jesus has been raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 21. But in fact, Christ has been risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. This is why the obscure line in a single verse that we're looking at here is so important, that Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit. It is because of the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead on that third day that we can be assured of our salvation and hold on to that hope that we have as Christians that Jesus has defeated death and that we will also be raised again to be with Jesus. The next part of this uh, verse says, Seen by angels. Not only was Jesus raised from the dead on the third day, but his resurrection was witnessed by both angels and man. Do you remember our reference to angels uh, in the Bible regarding Christ's resurrection when it first happens? Yes, so just after Jesus' resurrection. Let's check it out. Matthew 28, 2-4. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. The Bible tells us that even the angels are intrigued by what is happening and they've witnessed what is happening. The great uh, preacher Spurgeon says on this topic, the apostles... The apostle mentions this to show the greatness of our religion since the noblest intellects, being the angels, are interested in it. Did you ever hear of angels hovering around the assembly of physi physiological societies? 
Spurgeon also points out that the Godhead was seen in Christ by angels as they'd never seen it before. They beheld the attributes of justice, they'd seen the attributes of power, they'd marked the attributes of wisdom, and they'd seen the prerogativeness of sovereignty. But never had angels seen love and condescension and tenderness and pity in God as they saw these things resplendent in the person and the life of Christ. We commonly think of Jesus' resurrection as being witnessed by over 500 people, but rarely do we consider the fact that Jesus' resurrection was also witnessed by angels who were amazed. This leads us to the next part of our verse, proclaimed amongst the nations. Here we see a reference of the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is shared throughout the world. We see Jesus' great commission to his followers in Matthew 28, 19-20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. You see, the job of the church is not to impact the church, but to impact the world. It's, all, it's like a huddle in a football game. A hundred thousand people at the MCG, they don't pay money for a ticket to watch an AFL game. Uh, for instance, what if you were to go and see a Hawthorne versus Collingwood game, and for two and a half hours, you were to watch 22 men stand in a circle and talk about what it is that they're going to do. That's not what you pay for. 100,000 people pay for a ticket to see what difference the huddle makes. They want to know, um, is having spoken about how they're going to play the game amongst themselves, does it work in the game, in the public arena? The challenge for us as a church is not what we do when we call our Sunday morning or evening huddle, but what we do when we break our huddle and head out into our Sunday or weekly assignment. When Satan lines up against us, what difference does it make that we are Christians? Jesus calls for us to share the good news with those who don't know Jesus. We are to share with those near to us and we are to share with those far from us. There is an urgency to the gospel as it deals with people's eternities. That's why some of the great men of the faith preached the way that they did. Um, it's said that Martin Luther's preaching aroused the church from a thousand years slumber during the Dark Ages, uh, the, the Devil's Millennium. It is easy to understand why. When we discover how Luther preached, he said, I preach as though crucif uh, Jesus was crucified yesterday, rose again from the dead today, and is coming back to the earth tomorrow. Did you know that on the northwest tower of St. Paul in London, uh, the great, there's a great bell known as Great Paul. This bell bears the inscription of 1 Corinthians 9.16. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. We are called to spread the good news about Jesus with as much urgency as any before us. It is because of the work of the Holy Spirit through the disciples of Jesus that the next phase has come in and is continuing to come into being. That next phase being the next part of the verse that we're looking at. Let's check it out. Believed on in the world. Jesus does not have a local following in the land of his birth in Judea only, but he is known throughout the world as the way the truth and the life, the Son of God. You will also notice that this phase is, phrase is very particular in what it actually says, specifically believed on in the world. Jesus wasn't just someone popular, a famous or infamous person in the known world. There was more to it being said here. Jesus, the Messiah, who was once claimed solely by the Jews, was now being preached to the Gentiles, and they were placing their faith in this Jewish Messiah. God was no longer solely claimed by the called out nation of Israel, but through Jesus, all people from every creed and race, every nation could call upon Jesus and find salvation and a restored relationship with the Heavenly Father. And this could only happen if they were to not just believe that Jesus existed, but if they believed on Jesus. That is, they place their faith in the one sent by God to save them from their sins. And this leads us to our final phrase, uh, taken up in glory. 
finally we see reference to Jesus's ascension to heaven to sit on the right hand side of God. We see the ascension of Jesus recorded by witnesses in a number of books in the Bible. So Luke 24, 51, while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Acts 1, 9 says, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Jesus didn't stay here on the earth after the resurrection. The time wasn't right, nor would it have been practical. Um, that's why Jesus made the point in John 16, 7, when he said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When Jesus left, he was able to send the Holy Spirit to be with all of his followers. Jesus' physical presence could only be in one place at one time, while the Holy Spirit could be with all people at all times. Jesus, he, Jesus victoriously ascended up into heaven to sit on the right-hand side of God the Father, as we see in Hebrews 1.3. Um, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You'll note that Jesus took his place at the right hand of God after he had completed the work of salvation and the purification of the sins of humanity. The work has been done. The debt has been paid. God's wrath had been satisfied. Justice has been dealt and salvation has been secured by Jesus on the cross and when he died for our sins. And hope has been restored to humanity when Jesus rose again and ascended to heaven. Where Romans 8.34 tells us, Jesus Christ is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Jesus is even now interceding on our behalf before the Father. But that's not the end of the story. The Bible tells us that Jesus will be coming back again, but this time with a different mission. There will be a day when all who have ever lived will find themselves before the judgment seat of God and will be judged based on what they did with Jesus. Did they have Jesus as their Lord and Saviour or did they reject him? My friends, there will be a day of reckoning and each of us will need to give an account of their lives. My fellow believers, simply let me encourage you to press into Jesus. Build that relationship with him. Draw closer to him while that great day of judgment looms. And while you're at it, tell others about the one who has saved you and can save them. Share Jesus with those around you. Share Jesus with this nation and beyond. Share Jesus with those, for instance, that are in parks or your hometown, wherever you are listening. He is your Lord and Saviour, and he is well worth sharing with others. If you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, then let me encourage you to rectify this situation now. Speak with somebody about Jesus. Ask questions. Get yourself a Bible and read it. It's all true. Jesus loves you and he died for you so that his sins could, so that your sins could be forgiven and so that you could be put right with God. Jesus is well worth getting to know. He thought you were well worth dying for. Maybe you should get to know this person who loved you that much. Let me close with the same advice that... Uh, father in my opening story gave to his son about the greatest treasure. The book, the Bible that you hold in your right hand now is your way to finding the greatest treasure man has ever known. If you will read it with a prayerful heart and a mind that is ready to receive the gift of God, then he will unwrap its mysteries for you to see what is truly God's greatest gift to man. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that uh, for those that don't know you, Lord, that they would be able to unwrap that mystery of the, that gift that there is there. Lord, that they would see and learn and, and have that relationship with Jesus. Lord, I just thank you for your love for us, Lord, that we can look at verse 16 and see your gospel there. Lord, I just thank you for this and, and just how powerful it is in its entirety. Lord, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would touch people's hearts today and those that don't know you, Lord, would seek you 
and those that do know you, Lord, would be encouraged to go out and tell others about the good news of what you have done. Lord, I just ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Matt, thank you so much for the message that you have brought us uh, today about the mysteries of this particular uh, piece of scripture. And certainly I hope it encourages all of us to, uh, to, to pick up the word and to, to read more into just the wonderful things that God has for each and every one of us. I just wanted to finish uh, today's service with this benediction. It comes from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verses 17 to 20. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. 
Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Timothy and all of us, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and to the opposing ideas of which is falsely called knowledge. And that's trust in Jesus, who is our, our King and our Saviour, and he will grant us all things. And we're just uh, so grateful for that. So again, just a, a little uh, reminder to all of our dads out there, just enjoy being spoilt uh, by your families. Um, I'm going to end here and I've... I've got a little bit of Lego that uh, Bailey and I need to go and construct. And so we um, enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to meeting up with you next week. See you then. Bye.